Thank you. Well, I'm going to start right away and get into the word. I want to read a passage from you from Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 to 25. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was his name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. The man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother, and hold fast to his wife, and they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. So we have been in a series uh, now, I think this is about the 13th message, and I'm only going to go a little bit longer, um, but uh, on hot topics, things that are uh, kind of being discussed in the public arena, that Christians need to know what the Bible teaches so that we can have intelligent input into those discussions. And, and I just want to remind you that I, I'm not necessarily looking for us to argue our perspective, simply to reason with people and share what Christians believe about different topics. And we have addressed a whole, whole host of them. If you want to review any of them, you can go to our website and listen to the various messages and uh, today I want to talk about two that are pretty much out there in the forefront, same-sex marriage and gender identity. Uh, now, these are discussions, unfortunately, that in many ways Christians today are not even invited to the table to have conversation. Uh, Christina Odon is the former deputy director or editor of The New Statesman. It's a left-of-center British magazine. And she tells of an experience a few years ago that left her speechless regarding the new intolerance. She writes, I was invited to speak at a conference on marriage last summer held, held at the Law Society in London. The conference was a chance for supporters of traditional marriage to contribute to the debate. The title, One Man, One Woman, Making the Case for Marriage for the Good of Society, uh, that's what it was called. I accepted without a second thought. A few days before the conference, the sponsors of the event the Law Society refused to let us meet on their premises. Uh, the theme was, contrary to our diversity policy, the Society explained in an email to the organizers, uh, espousing as it does an ethos which is opposed to same-sex marriage. In other words, she writes, the Law Society regarded support for heterosexual union as discriminatory. Hurriedly, another venue was found in the heart of London, a publicly owned modern building situated across the street from Westminster Abbey. But with only 24 hours to go before the conference, managers at that venue told Christian Concern that the subject it planned to discuss was inappropriate. The booking was canceled. When challenged, the center's chief executive cited its diversity policy as the reason for cancellation. A journalist asked for a copy of the diversity policy. The center refused to provide it. She writes, by the time I took part in the event, which had been moved to the basement of a hotel in central London, I concluded that not only Christians, but also Muslims and Jews increasingly feel they are no longer free to express, express any belief that runs counter to the prevailing fashions for superficial tolerance and equality. Intolerance is now state-sanctioned. That, that may well be the case, but I, I'd like to encourage you that I think there's still room for us to squeeze in on the discussion. And, and I, I believe the right approach is not to hammer them with the truth. God the Holy Spirit is really good at using his word to accomplish his purposes, but simply to share the truth, to say to people, listen, I have a foundation for truth in my life. It is the Bible as a Christian, and here's what it says on the issue. And one of the things that we'll do when we do that is we'll challenge them to think about where do they find their basis for truth. And I, I guarantee that the vast majority have never even thought about it, let alone 
uh, ever responded to someone who asked the question. And, and so it might help them to think that through a little bit and say, you know, how do I come to arrive at what I believe is true? And so you don't have to argue, you don't have to reason, but you have to know what the Bible teaches on these topics. And so today I'm going to talk about a same-sex marriage and then in a little bit uh, also about gender dysphoria, which is uh, gender confusion. So let's start with what some of the arguments are today and that were used to help legalize same-sex marriage in America. Uh, 50 years ago, there was no debate because no one even considered the possibility of same-sex marriage. Today, it's law in all 50 states. And here were some of the arguments um, that were used to help uh, support it. Number one, uh, it's the way God made me. It's the argument that God created certain people with an attraction to the same sex. And so that being the case, how could it be wrong for them to express their sexuality in this way, assuming that God made them that way? Well, first of all, just a, a quick response. The vast majority of scientists still today agree that they have never located a uh, gay gene that leads someone to a propensity to have a homosexual uh, lifestyle. Uh, they, they just say that there is no evidence that it exists. And so any claim to that is so far scientifically unfounded. Uh, the fact is, is that God created us male and female, called us to a one flesh union where we can engage in a, a, a kind of sexual intimacy and in doing so, fulfill the mandate that God gave to Adam and Eve, where it says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Obviously, this is an impossibility for a same-sex marriage. Second, even if there were such a gene out there, a gay gene, science recognizes that there is a distinction between genes that kind of make up our characteristics in our body and then other genes that lead us to have desires and predispositions. And so the former, the genes that make up our body, determine if your eyes are going to be brown or blue, and if your hair is going to be red or you're going to be follically challenged. They determine all of those things. The latter kind of genes, if in fact they exist, uh, they cause us to lean towards certain behaviors. Uh, some people say that there's a genetic predisposition to maybe addictions like alcohol or other things. But here's the thing to remember about those, quote, genetic predispositions. No matter what predisposition we have, we are not robots when it comes to them who have no option but to give in to them. Uh, no matter what, we still have the ability to exercise self-control over inappropriate desires. If someone has a genetic predisposition to anger, we don't say, well, that gives you the right to vent it in any way that you want, any time you want. We would say you need to learn to exercise self-control over that. And that would include, in this discussion, exercising self-control over same-sex attraction. Here's another one that, that is often heard. It's cruel to deny homosexuals the happiness and fulfillment of marriage. Uh, the argument goes like this. Assuming that same-sex attraction is uh, as much a part of one's nature as anything else, then only the most cold-hearted person would deny someone else the right to pursue sexual intimacy within, with the same sex. But there's a flaw in this thinking, and here's the flaw. It assumes that happiness and fulfillment are based exclusively on sexual intimacy. And they are not. If that's the case, and a person desires to obey God and live as a single person in holiness, then we are saying that that single person can never be happy or fulfilled. It is not based exclusively on sexual fulfillment. There is much more to relationships than that. In fact, we would say that real satisfaction, purpose, and meaning in life, joy, comes from our relationship with God. It says in Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So we would argue that it, it has very little to do with that and so much more to do with the person's relationship with God and the intimacy that they share with, with him. Uh, there's a, a third argument, which I think was very effective. It's a matter of civil rights. 
Uh, this is how they really, in my opinion, won the debate. Uh, gay activists equated their drive for same-sex marriage with the battles fought here in America for the freedom of all people, including uh, people of color, uh, so that they could have their freedoms, and for women to have the right to vote. The truth is, is that that approach worked. But Christians need to realize that it's one thing to say that we believe in civil rights for people based on race, religion, or gender, and it's quite another to say that we believe in civil rights for all based on just their chosen behaviors. Uh, the Bible calls same-sex relationships abomination. Uh, if you know someone in a same-sex relationship, I, I know that seems harsh, but it is the word that's used in the scripture to describe it. It's the same word, by the way, that's used in scripture to talk about idolatry, lying lips, and adultery. And so what are we saying? Well, it, it may not be a matter of civil rights at all. Now, it was argued that way, but the truth is, is that just because someone has a chosen lifestyle doesn't mean that it's necessarily their right to engage in it. We would not argue that, at least at this point, for someone who says, I want to engage in an intimate relationship with a child or with an animal. And so uh, maybe it shouldn't be in the category of civil rights. And then fourthly, some people say, look, I don't know why Christians are so upset. Jesus didn't even mention homosexuality in his ministry. And it's true. If you read the Gospels, he didn't. He didn't talk about it. But it doesn't mean that Jesus didn't have an opinion on homosexuality. Jesus looked at the Old Testament as the scriptures that God had given to the people, the Jews, and that they, he had come to fulfill them and that they were God's law for the people. And in the Old Testament, it says in Leviticus 18, that you shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Jesus did not speak of homosexuality, but he did affirm that marriage was meant to be between a man and a woman. He said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. They're male and female. What God has joined together, let no man separate. So why should we, as Christians, be concerned about same-sex marriage? A lot of believers today say, look, it's just the law of the land. We have to learn to live with it. Why should we be concerned with it? And, and I want to say that I, I think there are some legitimate reasons that we ought to be. First, same-sex marriage is part of a broader strategy to reinvent the family. Uh, the family, by the way, is the first institution ordained of God in the Bible when God said to Adam, uh, cleave to your wife and become one flesh. So there was marriage, and then he said, be fruitful, multiply, and the family was ordained by God. Today, there's an attempt to kind of redefine the family unit. In Europe, not too long ago, they created something called civil solidarity pacts. Uh, they did it so that People who were living a homosexual lifestyle could file joint tax returns and receive welfare and unemployment benefits. But these pacts were actually easier to enter into and to exit from, and they imposed fewer legal obligations. So guess what happened? Heterosexual couples who would have normally gotten married decided that they didn't need to be married either and honor the institution that God ordained. They could enter into civil solidarity pacts. And that's what they did. And no one remembered that this, that the average cohabitational relationship lasts only five years. So if you're talking about creating stability in the family, those relationships don't work. Here's another thought for you. Now that it's a law, Christians who speak out on same-sex marriage potentially can be accused of hate speech. Matter of fact, in our bylaws, we were advised by a lawyer that we need to have a statement that we will not perform same-sex marriages because very soon the government could say to church, churches, listen, if you have no position on it, then you must do what we say, and so you will perform same-sex unions. Now, because I believe it's not a part of what God ordained for people, then we have to look at it differently. And so we actually have a statement in there that says that we recognize marriage to be between a man and a woman before God in a committed life together marked by social, physical, spiritual, and sexual intimacy for life. Though today, 
there's potential that you can have people convicted of hate crimes. It's happening in Canada right now. Um, hate speech legislation makes it illegal to speak against homosexuality in the media. If you do, you're going to be arrested. It's not far from happening here in America. Here's a third reason that we should be concerned. It's, it's eroding people's confidence in the scriptures to speak to matters of life. For, for generations, for really millennia, no one argued the fact that marriage was between a man and a woman. Only in the 20th century were those discussions starting to come about, and in the 21st century where it was made law. And so for all those 2,000 years, homosexuality was viewed as a sin. Today, you find, quote, people who know the Bible who are now arguing that we've interpreted it wrongly for 2,000 years, and the right interpretation is this, is that every verse that speaks negatively about the practice of homosexuality and same-sex relationships is culturally based. And the reason that it was denounced in the scriptures is because it wasn't appropriate to that culture. But since it is appropriate to our culture today, that it's okay. You may remember Sodom and Gomorrah, right? You remember that story? So uh, two angels go to meet with Lot and, and they come to his house and the people there in Sodom and Gomorrah, they come and say, send those men out that they could lie with us and they wanted to engage in a homosexual act with them and Lot wouldn't permit it. The angels stayed inside, they struck the, the people blind and the next day they left and, and God judged Sodom and Gomorrah. And today, some of these scholars, some of these Bible teachers will refer to a passage out of Ezekiel uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, which mentions one of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. It says that they did not take care of the poor, that they were prideful, and that they were unkind. And they'll say, see, God didn't judge Sodom and Gomorrah because they were engaged in same-sex relationships, but because they were prideful and unkind to the poor. But in the New Testament, in Jude, which only has one chapter, so it just counts verses, in verse 7, it, it says this, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, served as an example by undergoing punishment of eternal fire. The New Testament interprets the Old Testament and says, no, God judged them because they gave in to unnatural desire and sexual morality. So there's uh, people today who are becoming confused and losing confidence in the word because uh, it is being... Uh, reinterpreted in light of our culture. So what does the Bible teach about marriage? Well, I, I talked on this not too long ago, so I won't dwell on it except to say that the Bible uh, is meant to reflect God's plan and his purpose. His plan for marriage was a man and a woman uh, in a committed relationship for life that's marked by everything that I said, by social, spiritual, intellectual, and physical intimacy. That's how God designed it. God made from Adam Eve, and in doing so separated femininity from masculinity and created two distinct people. And in doing so made a, a powerful statement about sexuality, that the physiological differences between man and woman are a result of God's grand design, and he called it very good. God provided a female companion that would be a suitable helper for Adam because it was not good for the man to be alone. That was God's plan. What's his purpose in doing so? It was meant to mirror at least two fundamental aspects of God. That God is a plurality. Uh, we believe in a doctrine called the Trinity. The Trinity says there is one God who exists eternally in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. They all are God. They all have the exact same nature, although they have different roles. And so there is a plurality, three persons of the Trinity. In marriage, you have two persons coming together. But it's not only a plurality, but it's also a unity. The Bible says God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, he is one. He exists eternally in three persons, but they are of the exact same essence, so they are one. And in marriage, you have two people coming together, and Paul says they will cleave together and become one flesh, and they will portray the very nature of God to the world. That word cleave there, that, the, that hold fast, some interpretations say it, it means that they are cemented together, that they're glued together in this relationship. 
and that God intends for them to honor their commitments. Someone writes, it's a yearning for completeness, for a man and a woman to come together physically, emotionally, socially, socially and spiritually in an indivisible relationship and bear the image of God who himself exists in everlasting unity. By the way, this is kind of how Paul in the New Testament describes marriage. He says in the New Testament that the man reflects God in, in the relationship and the woman reflects uh, the Christ's bride, the church. So it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for her uh, to make her holy. And so that plurality of, of the, the man and the woman and the unity of being one flesh is reflected in the church. So it, it also says, even among us, that we are one body with many members. That, that idea of plurality and unity is found throughout Scripture, and it tells us something about the very nature of God. And so marriage was meant to reflect that. God had a plan for it, how it would work, and he had a purpose for it. But it would mean that you would have two sexes coming together, not one. And that it would create oneness that would be a reflection of God's, God's relationship with his church. So God's plan for marriage and, uh, was built around the one man and one woman freely committed to each other for life. Now, let's stop there on same-sex marriage. I'll come back to you in a second to say this. We're not here to to bash people or attack people who, who are struggling with a, a same-sex attraction. And if they've gotten married, uh, we're not here to, to hit them over the head with our Bibles. But we ought to be able to engage in the conversation and at least share as Christians why we believe what we believe. And then let God do his thing in their lives. But let's talk for a few remaining minutes about gender confusion or gender dysphoria. It's the condition of feeling one's emotional and psychological identity uh, uh, confusing them uh, as male or female uh, when in fact you're the opposite in the biological sex. So today, if you look at Facebook, you can actually declare one of 58 different genders that they list there. Uh, they actually have these, there's four of them, gender fluid, gender queer, pangender, and two-spirit. Obviously, there's a lot of confusion out there today about gender, and I wonder if Christians are also equally confused, so let me set the record straight. God created only two sexes, male and female. I did some research this week. Scientists today say that there's about 37.2 trillion cells in the human body. With the exception of 10 trillion red blood cells, the other 27 trillion are different in men and women based on this fact, that men have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome, and women have two X chromosomes, and that means that all those cells are different. And what it means is this, that even if a person undergoes surgery to change their sexuality from one gender to the other or claims another gender, it hasn't in fact changed who they really are based on their biological nature. They still are the same person. It hasn't changed. Just ask Tamika Brents. Tamika Brents is a mixed martial arts fighter, and she had the misfortune of fighting Fallon Fox, a biological male who was approved to fight as a woman because he identified as one. In two and a half minutes, Tamika Brents was sent to a hospital with a broken skull and a concussion. She needed seven surgical staples to bind her wounds. The battered woman, a trained fighter herself, said of her opponent, I have never felt so overpowered in my life. Do you see why? He's a man fighting a woman. His nature, his biological nature hasn't changed at all. God created only two sexes, one male and one female. Did you know that even our brains are wired differently? According to neuroscience, a woman's brains are suited to social skills and memory. It's true, isn't it? That's why in your house, when you can't find something, who do you go to? Dad? He barely knows where he lives. <laughs> you go to the mom. Mom, where's my socks? They're in your drawer. Second drawer down on the right. They remember stuff like that. 
It says of men that we have perception and coordination. That's why we can know what's the difference between north and south and east and west. Never give a woman direction saying, go south for about a mile and a half and then turn east. Uh, if you say that, she's going to be in Mississippi in no time. <laughs> you got to say, okay, when you, when you get to the colony house, turn left and then go down that road and you'll see a big red barn. And when you see the big red barn, just go by it one more street and then turn right and they'll find their way. God made our brains differently. He made our bodies different. He created only two sexes, male and female. Here's something else I want you to remember. Confusing the distinctions between men and women undermines the ability of both to rightly reflect the glory of God. You see, the Old and New Testaments both picture the relationship between God and his people as a relationship between his husband and his bride. I just talked about that. So God makes it clear through the Apostle Paul that even marriage is meant to be a reflection of that. And these God-given differences between men and women are necessary so that that relationship can reflect God's glory back to him. If a man tries to be a woman, God is left out of the equation. If a woman tries to be a man, God's people are left out of the equation and God doesn't get any glory. And then just... To be clear, because sometimes pastors have to sort of be prophets and just speak truth um, in a very clear way. The entire movement to determine one's own gender is sinful. It is uh, in direct opposition to how God created us, and uh, it is not what God wants for human beings. Our gender is based on our biological nature. And that's why he could prohibit men from acting like women and women from acting like men. Like in Deuteronomy 22, it says, A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on woman's clothing, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. God never intended for men to act like women or for women to act like men. He's saying that our gender is determined by our biological sex and not by choice. And we wrap it up today by asking this question, how should we respond to someone who's struggling with same-sex attraction or gender dys dysphoria? Well, to be clear, we have to be careful that as Christians, when we share, that we understand where the Bible stands on these topics, that it views them as contrary to God's will. And so we have to be careful that we don't sort of say to people, well, it's okay but it isn't for me. Because as truth tellers, Christians have to be able to say to people, you know, I, I love you and I care about you a lot. But if you're wondering where the Bible comes down on this, it says that it's not right. Uh, in fact, it calls it an abomination. It calls it sin. Secondly, uh, Christians are never called to hate people who are struggling with either, either one gender identity or same-sex attraction. Um, if you read the Bible, the impression you get of Christians, and I say this all the time, is, is we're just a bunch of redeemed screw-ups who are trying to screw up less. We have the power of the Holy Spirit, but he's taking people who have all kinds of wrong beliefs and wrong assumptions about the world, and through a process where he is working in our lives, we're slowly learning to think and act the way God wants us to, but it's a lifelong process. And so every one of us here is, is in that process at some point, and we don't have the right to point a finger at anybody else who's messed up because we're equally messed up. We're called to work out our salvation in fear and in trembling, and that means we're called to work hard to put off the flesh and put on the spirit. So we're just redeemed screw-ups trying to screw up less and to look at anybody else and to say, I hate you because of where you're at, that's, that's unloving. It's unkind. And it will not lead people to faith in Jesus. Thirdly, those in same-sex marriages or choosing to identify as the opposite sex should be welcome in the church. And now you're welcome here. Now, some of you might be going, what? Listen. 
if they can't come here, and if they can't come and sit under the teaching of God's word and hear the good news of Jesus Christ, where are they going to go to hear it? Are they going to go down the street and stand at the corner in the bar and hear how God loves them and how Christ died for them? No. I invite anybody, I don't care where they're at in life, to come here. The church let me go when I was a jerk. When I thought I was good enough to earn my way to heaven and that God would be privileged to have me and the Holy Spirit's talked to my heart and I repented of my sin and I gave my life to Christ. People are welcome here. I understand it might make us a little uncomfortable. But if it does, remember this. They're here. And God can work through his word and through his people. And so let's not be afraid to invite people struggling with sins. None of us. Let's invite everybody. And let's let God do his thing. So I want to close with this. These are hard sermons. I'm not the kind of guy who likes to do these. But it's truth. And I just want to say, if you're someone here today who struggles with gender dysphoria or same-sex attraction, it doesn't mean you're a terrible human being. You're just like the rest of us. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that's why we need a Savior, Jesus. If you're struggling, you can come to Jesus and he'll help you to overcome that struggle. He gives us his Holy Spirit so that he can make us holy and he gives us real power to live the Christian life. And it comes through faith in Christ. So if you're at a point in your life where you're saying, you know, I'm, I'm giving in, I, I can't seem to, to figure out who I am as a human being or who I'm supposed to be attracted to, Turn to Jesus and let us help you find him. And let us help you to understand his will for your life. Jesus, he said this, I have come that you could have life and have it abundantly. Jesus didn't come to ruin our lives. He he came to make them by leading us out of slavery to sin and into the kingdom of heaven. And that's what we want for all of us. So if you're struggling, just talk to me talk to one of the elders, talk to someone you know who loves Jesus. We'll get you headed in the right direction, and I promise as much as we are able, we will walk alongside of you, and we will help you in every way that we can so that you can experience the blessing of God. Let me pray. Lord, I know these are tough topics, but either your word is true or it's not. And if it's not, then like Paul, we're just fools and we should eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. But if it's true, then you have a plan for mankind and you expect us to live that out. And you say it's the best possible plan and it will lead us to the greatest possible life. And it comes through faith in Jesus and being born again into the kingdom of heaven. I pray, Lord, that if there's anybody here today, anybody, who doesn't have a personal relationship with you, that today they might turn to you and say, Jesus, I want that. I want you to come and take up residence in my heart and forgive my sin and make me into a new creature. I want to have that kind of relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that you are ready and willing. You say, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. We are so grateful. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.